Good morning, church. We are now officially in spring. Uh, the weather uh, should be getting uh, better, nicer each day, warmer, uh, and, and hopefully uh, this will help us to control the spread of the virus and that we can come back here uh, soon. Spring, then I think of uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we have this uh, problem with the bees at our house. Uh, it was about almost exactly uh, two years ago, and uh, one day, you know, when we come home, and then I sort of felt that something is uh, unusual. I noticed there's a lot of bumblebees you know, uh, flying around, around your house. So I said, hmm, this uh, does not look good. So I walked around the house and then noticed uh, that our dryer, uh, dryer vent, usually the dryer vent goes outside and then there's a louver, a cover uh, on that exhaust duct, when it's about this big, the louver. So I noticed that the, the louver, which is also the cover uh, for the dryer vent duct, uh, fell to the ground. I don't know when that happened, uh, but then I noticed all these bumblebees just flying and uh, buzzing, uh, going in and out. I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I don't know how long this has been going on. So they're all going inside. They probably did not go inside the house because we did not notice any uh, bees in the house. They probably, I mean, they all went inside the wall and start building their empire there. So what would you do when you see that all these bees invading your house? Right. So the first thing I did is without even thinking, uh, and ignore all the dangers. I just pick up that cover with my bare hand, no glove, and quickly just pluck it back in the wall. Right? And then I run as fast as I can back into my house, close the door, you know, close my blinds and <laughs> drapes, and then peek outside. Right? And then after a few minutes, and then I went out there and see and the bees are still buzzing and trying to squeeze through the gaps going into the, the walls, the cracks inside the walls. So I, now this time I'm more prepared, so I put on my hoodies, my gloves, <laughs> sunglasses. Uh, I don't have a mask yet. In those two years ago, we don't, we don't know what the mask is. <laughs> so I don't have a mask, so I, I, I go out there and then put duct tapes around the edge, edges. And then I noticed all the bees and all trying really hard fighting and trying to get into the, the wall. But of course, with the duct tape all sealed, uh, they couldn't. And then they're all struggling and they're hitting. I can see that they're all really suffering. <laughs> so I went to the house and then I, Sim and I talked and that, okay, now the bees cannot come in now. So what happened to all the bees inside the wall? They cannot get out now. <laughs> so I said, mm, okay, there should be enough uh, food for, there, for them to last a long time. Or just leave them in there, you know, just nice and cool. Uh, just let them uh, die inside the wall. I mean, what, what can we do? <laughs> so every time we go outside, we, 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 look, we look, and then I, I feel sorry for the bees. When they try very hard, and then some of them just die trying lying on over exhausted, lying on the floor, and they all together ganging up, all try their part, all their energy, try to squeeze in under the duct tape. Right? But of course they could not, but they keep trying. So I had to admire their uh, courage and unity. And I said, I wish our church members, we say, see, like those bees, you know, just keep trying, never give up, uh, doing all their best, you know, even commit their life, uh, I should expect that, uh, to get the job done. And after a day or two, and then we notice that there's a bee in our laundry room. I said, oh no, there must be a crack somewhere, maybe under the light, you know, the light bulb. They start getting inside the house. Since these are bumblebees, they're good things, good stuff, we should not kill them. So we use a plastic bag and pick them up. They're usually when the time they, they're in the laundry room, they're all exhausted, very tired, frustrated, lost, despair. 
So we use a plastic bag, pick them up nicely, gently, 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 and then take them outside and put them out uh, outside the door, and then the bee will try again, try to get in. So I said, okay, we just keep doing that. Uh, eventually, they get all the bees out, right? So the next day, we have three or four in our laundry room. I said, okay. So we're going to spend a lot of time. Some of them are not easy to reach, and we don't want to kill them. You know, this is a, a God's creation, and they, they are not doing any harm to us. So next day, we pick up four or five bees, and then eventually getting more. So this has been going on for a week. We pick up more bees, and then one morning, I woke up, and then I, find, I found a bee next to my pillow. I said, okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so they start coming closer and closer to us. And I don't know, I don't want to wake up one morning and then got bees all over my head. Right? So I said, okay, no, you win, we lost. So Cindy and I decided, okay, we have to give up. They won. So we go outside, took the tape off, Remove the cover and I said that my friend, peace, my house is yours. Feel free to come in <laughs> and live inside our wall. So they just keep, they're so happy, they, they keep coming in and then uh, we just, then, then they don't come inside our house anymore. So we are peace uh, until about two months later and then they all, they finish their thing, they all disappear, no more bees. So we put the cover on. So this is the taught us a lesson that when you are united together, even the little bees, they're so powerful. I'm so much bigger, heavier than they are, but we gave up. We gave up. They won. When we are united together, we will win. So our church mission statement is unify in Christ for the mission of God. When we are united together, though we are individually, we are weak, we may be small. But when we join together, we are so powerful, like those bees. We can win people for God. We can win people into the kingdom. But individually, these bees are weak. I can pick them up one by one. But when they gang up together, they are strong. The church of Corinth is a church with problems. They quarrels. They fight against each other. The Corinth, the two books, the two letters of the Corinth tell us that this is a church with lots of problems, different kind of problems. But the very first problem that Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is divisions. That's the biggest problem to this church. And this is the first problem that Paul tried to resolve here. They quarrel, they fight against each other. This is the worst thing that could happen to a church. Can you imagine all the bees start fighting? No, should we continue to go into this house or should we go and start a new home? No, they all united together. We have to invite Pastor Norman's home. <laughs> That's our home. When they unite together, they are strong. When we quarrel, the church will fall. Satan always hates Christian fellowship and unity. I think the first priority of Satan is not to discourage us to read Bible, to prayer meetings, because we know that we are diehard, you know, we all want to learn the Bible, we want to go to prayer meeting, at least some of us. Uh, but Satan always tries to break us up from within, that we fight against each other. And this is a church that Paul trying to tell them that you have to be united together. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all agree. The better, uh, the more literal translation is all speak the same thing or speak with one voice. Like in the covenant of our pastor and elders, speak with one voice. That you may be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. All agree, no divisions among you. Speak with one voice. Doesn't mean that we are like our parents. 
whenever someone said, uh, will you do this? Yes, yes, we will do this. No, not like in some of the uh, governments. You, know, you have to agree. You know, uh, uh, whatever the leader uh, says, you have to agree. It doesn't mean that here. We all speak with one voice. doesn't mean that we don't have any, we could not have any different opinions. It's called unity in diversity. Uh, but the uh, definition of unity in diversity is unity without uniformity. Unity without uniformity. We don't have different opinions. Right? Like in uh, our meetings, our planning meetings, uh, be it the Christmas party planning, uh, community day planning, uh, the board, well, we have different opinions. Uh, fellowship planning meeting, we have different opinions. But unity without uniformity. When we have different opinions, we have diversities, it's okay. But diversity without fragmentation. When we have different opinions, that's okay. But we are still united. Once we decided on something, we unite ourselves together. So it's unity without uniformity and diversity without fragmentation. We are really blessed that we see, see here we have at least three cultures. We are truly a multicultural church. Uh, we have more than three cultures here, at least. At least we have three languages, uh, official languages, have we say, see, right? uh, or worship uh, languages. But we united together for the kingdom of God. And if you find that it's difficult to attend a church with different cultures because we have to accommodate each other's needs. But can you imagine when we go to heaven? Uh, the church on earth is a rehearsal of what it is in heaven. If you have trouble in uh, worshiping together with three different cultural groups, you're going to be in great trouble when you get to heaven heaven. We have different gifts in the church. Some have the gifts of teaching, uh, singing, uh, evangelism, uh, but we all join together so that we are one. We are united together. When we are three people, if two of them want to go this direction, one want to go this direction. So when we vote, three to one. So that's majority. <laughs> So all three of us will go in that direction with one, in one accord. So the one did not vote for that direction, cannot keep mumbling and complaining and saying that, you know, I never vote for this direction. Uh, if that mission failed, and they said, see, I told you, we should have gone that way. We don't say that. When we voted together in one direction, we will support it. Even if it did not work out, you do not know. Maybe the other direction is even a bigger disaster. You do not know. Right? We will support it in one accord. Speak the same thing. All agree. That is unity in di with diversity. Unify in Christ for the mission of God. With the same mind, same thinking. Um, and Cynthia and I, uh, I can say that we you know, we married, been married for many years. Uh, I can say that we have the same mind. Uh, and uh, we, as we uh, grew together older and older, uh, we, our minds are even more <laughs> similar. When we go to a restaurant to eat, she knows what I like to eat, uh, basically everything. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm one of those uh, uh, people who uh, would enjoy any, any kind of food, uh, and, and she knows. Uh, she knows what kind of chocolate I like. Actually, I like any kind of chocolate. So, uh, so we think the same, same mind. So how do we in a church uh, with such as diverse uh, members from different backgrounds, uh, cultures, how can we have the same mind? We need to pray together. Praying aligns our minds together. It, it's not just discussion. We like to plan, uh, discuss, uh, evaluate, but we need to pray more. Praying is not just a shopping list for God. Praying is for us to align with each other and with God. When we are two people praying together, when we are two, 
person praying together, actually, there are always three. Because the scripture told us that you know, when two of us are praying together, uh, God is with us. So when two people pray meeting, always have three people present. God is there. And God will align us together with his mind. So with the same mind and the same judgment. Actually, the same mind and same judgment uh, is a very similar meaning, uh, but it's a different, uh, two different words in the Greek. Same judgment, determine, determining thoughts. Right. When we have the same mind, we will do the same thing. Uh, and and Cindy and I, uh, we have the very same mind. Uh, we, don't, we don't care much about the kind of car we, we, we drive. Uh, small house that we lived in, and we, we, she never complained, I never complained, so we live in a very small old house. Um, and we, we don't care about big, expensive, uh, expensive dinners, and we, we, we have the same mind, and then we always make the same judgment. Uh, when some years ago, uh, I wanted to go and serve in a smaller church uh, for a few years, and Cynthia said, yeah, let, let's go together. Uh, when we feel that you no, know, it's better for her to support my ministry and the family. And then she gave up her career uh, as an accountant. Uh, when we decided the time to move on to another church to serve, so she always, we always go together. Uh, when I decided uh, if I should serve in this church as a senior pastor, and then she supported me. So we always have the same mind, same judgment. Uh, we pray together. We, we uh, join our mind together. So, Paul here is, is appealing to the uh, church members at Corinth. You speak with one voice. You think a lie. And then you make the same decision and judgment to move forward. Do the same. But instead, the church of Corinth is anything but a unified church. It's a divided church. So, Paul said that there's division in you. Division, the Greek word is schisma. Schisma is where we develop that English uh, 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 word today is uh, schizophrenia, splitting, to split. D.L. Moody once said that I have never yet known the Spirit of God to work where the lost people were divided. When we quarrel, argue, when we are divided, the Spirit of God cannot work in our midst. It's better to be united than have all these big plans that people do not fully agree on. When we are united, God will lead us. We don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about which direction we should go. God will lead us. But the Church of Corinth is a divided church. Uh, by groups, by identifying themselves with one of the four groups. I belong to the group of Paul, you know, the gang of four. I belong to Paul. Right? And I said, I belong to Apollo. Right? He's a scholar, uh, a, a learned a speaker, a very good speaker, uh, a learned church leader very knowledgeable. I belong to Apollo, the theologian. I want to follow him. Or I belong to uh, Severus, Peter. Right? He's close to Jesus. No, I want to be close to uh, him so that I can be closer to uh, Jesus. And I, I belong to Christ. So, so what's wrong with that? Right? So this group of people think that they're, they're more, more uh, closer to Jesus, uh, to Christ, than the other people. They, they, they elevate themselves. Uh, they're more proud. Uh, they're more Spiritual, at least they think. No, we belong to Christ. No, you, you are not. Right? So there f seems to be at least four factions in this church. Uh, they all try to identify to a leader. So the church is split. It's so sad. Right? Uh, and the scripture did not indicate that uh, these four groups are initiated you know, by the leaders, by Paul or by Apollo. You know? They probably have nothing to do with this. It's just the people identify. It's like today, you know, some young people like to identify. I support this celebrity, you know, this uh, singer, this movie star, you know, I, I, I'm his uh, fans, and you know, I'm uh, 
uh, her follower, so that you feel more important. You know, you belong to somebody. Right? No, no one wants to be a fan of Pastor Norman. Maybe he's not famous or <laughs> uh, important. Right? You, you want to uh, associate yourself with somebody, a big movie celebrity superstar, be it a soccer star, a sports star. And where did this desire came from? There's a Greek mythology, a story about uh, Narcissus. Some of you may have read this. It's a story about Narcissus uh, and Echo. Echo is a uh, myth. A uh, myth uh, is a, uh, it's not a, a, a goddess, it's lower than a goddess. So it's about a story about Narcissus. Narcissus is the son of a river god. This is a uh, Greek mythology. Uh, it's the son of river god uh, Cephisius. And Narcissus is, uh, they describe him as impossibly, impossibly handsome. So he is the most good looking young man in his time. And the parents are very proud of him. But they were told that if you want Narcissus to live a long life, you cannot let him know himself. That means he cannot let him see his face. You know, uh, otherwise, he will be so proud. So his parents you know, broke all the mirrors you know, in the house and kept him from uh, being able to see his own face. But he, he, he knew that he is uh, the most handsome guy uh, in his time on, on, uh, uh, in his, on, on, on earth. Uh, so all the... Uh, young ladies, uh, even some young men, uh, came and tried to seek uh, after his love. But he is a very proud person. Because he, he, he knew that he is the most good-looking guy around. So he rejected everybody. And one day when he was hunting, uh, a, uh, a lady, uh, Echo, uh, spotted him and immediately fell in love with him. So Echo approached Narcissus, and Narcissus bluntly just turned her down and said, don't get even close to me. So Echo is a, actually a minor, they call it a minor female nature deity. And Echo was so sad and despair, and so she just she cannot eat, so she just wander around, wander around in the forest until eventually she disappear and become just an echo in the valley. And Narcissus continued to be a very proud young man. And the god of uh, the goddess of revenge, Nemesis, learned about this and she was really mad, so she decided to punish Narcissus. So she led him one day to a river. And in the river, and as Narcissus trying to drink, and then he saw his own reflection um, in the river. And it's the first time uh, he saw a reflection. Probably he, he was kept away from the river, uh, as there are no, no mirrors. And then he saw this good-looking, impossibly handsome person in the river uh, on the reflection. And then he immediately fell in love with his own reflection. So he would not go away, but he would not dare to touch. Every time he touched that water, uh, the reflection disappeared. So he did not dare to drink the water. So he kept staring at his own reflection and fell in love with himself. And eventually, eventually, he died. And then, at the place where he died, a flower uh, came up. You all know what that flower is. Uh, Narcissus, daffodil. A daffodil is, is named after Narcissus. He died. He died because of the fixation on himself. And today, um, we have a we call a narcissistic personality disorder, NDP. It's the fixation with oneself. The elements of narcissism, uh, NDP, sorry, NPD, 
have a sense of self-importance, experiencing fantasies about being influential, famous, important, exaggerating their abilities, talents, and accomplishments, craving admiration and acknowledgement, being preoccupied with beauty, love, power, and success. Narcissistic personality. And that psychologist developed into another group called collective or group narcissism. It's a group of people who think that they're more important. They, they, they feel that they should be more influential than other people. So they identify with the group. They feel that their group is extraordinary. And they want everybody to ally with their belief. And they insist upon their group getting the respect that it is due. But collective group narcissism, which is what Paul is uh, condemning here, all came from our individual desire, our personal desire inside ourselves. James 4, 1, 2. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle without you, within you? You covered, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. So this, be it individual narcissistic desire order, or be it the group collateral narcissism, it all, all came from our inside desire that we want to people to look at us individually. We are the most important people. And this caused us divisions, not only in church, in family, at workplaces, uh, in outside in the real world. The division in church quarrels and fight. It came from your desire, individual, within you. And that caused split thing in the church. What unites us together? Whatever disunites man from God also disunites man from man. This problem that we have between men, that we quarrel and fight with others, actually it is a reflection of our quarrel and fight with our God. So we have to go back to the source of this problem. So Paul said, what, what unites us together? Uh, has Christ been divided? Our unification is in and through Christ himself. Our unification is on the cross. There's only one Christ. We come to church to worship God, to have allegiance with Christ. And there's only one Christ at VCC, at all the churches in the world. Not only that we should have harmony between members here, we should have harmony with all the believers in this world. Really good, interesting translation uh, from uh, the Message Bible. I ask you, has the Messiah been chopped up in little pieces so we can each have a relic or our own? It, it, it is not an exact uh, uh, translation, as you know, uh, but it's kind of be interesting uh, how uh, Eugene uh, Pedersen interpret this. There's only one Christ. And we are all nailed together. We are a community of the cross. We are all nailed together in Christ, through Christ, on one cross. So that you can all speak the same thing and that there will be no divisions among you. But that you be perfectly joined together. Per perfectly joined together. Another translation. Be made complete. This word, join together, be made complete, has the meaning of being repaired, mend. Something is broken and put together again perfectly. I'm sure there's quarreling in our church, uh, maybe on an individual level, uh, on a group level, corporate level. Uh, this will there's always been, we'll be there quarreling, division. But let's mend this together, perfectly joined together again through Jesus Christ. We need to join together and speak with one voice. 
unity in diversity. We may have different opinions. That's good. We need that. But once the majority decide to, to go this way, we, we have to uh, join with one voice uh, and fully support uh, the group decisions. Uh, we can't keep saying that, no, I did not vote on this. Now see what happened. We never say that. We will join one voice. Imagine we are, imagine we are, uh, each one is a, a violin. Imagine we are 700 violins at church here. Can you imagine we are different violins made in different places, some made in Canada, made in Hong Kong, made in China, made in Vietnam, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, uh, from everywhere. No, these are different, made in different places, it looks different different color, different kind of, of material. So when we play together 700 violins, I, I'm sure it will be very difficult to, to, to listen. Right? It will be very annoying. Uh, it will be just noise. Right? So how do you get 700 violins to, to be in one voice? Well, you buy a tuner, a violin tuner. So you start tuning with the violin number one. So you tune it to this tuner, now, as long as you are 90% uh, tuned, well, hopefully 99, right? Even 90% is good enough. So you tune to the second violin, you tune to the third violin, and then you keep going until you tune the last one, the number 700 violin, to this one professional violin tuner. You don't tune with each other, right? Because you're, you, you may not be properly tuned yourself. No, you don't tune with each other. You bring people to Christ, not to yourself. Because you could be wrong. Maybe only 5% wrong. Sometimes the 5% is enough to distort the harmony in church. So everyone tune to one tuner, which is Christ himself. When we all 700 violin, all tune to Christ. So when we pray together, it will be in great harmony. It will be one voice. It will be perfectly joined together. Speak the same thing, same music, same mind, and same judgment. The only way it is possible to have one mind is to have the mind of God derived from the unity of the Spirit of God. A unity which comes only when believers, that's all of you, find the will of God in your life, in our church together, and give themselves unselfishly, unselfishly. I should have highlighted this word, unselfishly. Some serve the Lord selfishly. You may serve the Lord very hard, but if you self, serve selfishly, Selfishly, we could not have harmony. You have to serve the Lord unselfishly and unstingingly to its fulfillment. I read this one more time. The only way it is possible for us to have one mind is to have the mind of God. We need to all nail on the same clause. Derived from the unity of the Spirit of God. We need to pray together in the Spirit of one God. A unity which comes only when believers find the will of God. You need to be connected with God and give themselves unselfishly. Not I, but Christ. And unstingingly to his fulfillment. Let's pray. Father God, help us, we say, see. Help each one of us to serve you unselfishly. And that we can all pray together, have one mind, and we will work together, unity in diversity. We we'll all speak with one voice. When we unite together, when we are united together, we will be so strong, even though each one of us are weak, like the bumblebees. But when we are United together, one voice, we will be strong because you will be in our midst. You will be our general, be our leader. That help each one of us to nail ourselves 
on the cross. Not I, but Christ who lives in me and lives in us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.